three. This is the um, the midst of the depression, of course, and uh, Mary joins many of the workers in her shop who go out uh, on strike. The, the working conditions are just horrendous, and uh, they decide to strike. And in the beginning, Mary is very reluctant to do it, but finally her conscience gets the better of her, and she decides to join the strikers. The first day my mother marches on the picket line, she feels exhilarated like she used to on the dance floor when she was with a perfect partner and they never missed a step. She joins the other picketers in shouting out lusty labor songs. The union makes us strong. Hold the fort for we are coming, the international. She parades up and down 38th Street, waving her ILGWU picket sign. Did you know that sweatshops still exist? We are striking against intolerable working conditions at Alexander and Schwartz. The number of picketers increases every day, and whenever a new face appears, she cries with the other workers, welcome, comrade. She wants to help bring even more workers to the strike because she's disgusted by the humiliation of her days at Alexander and Schwartz. When Fania, one of the sewing machine operators, crosses the picket line, Mary shouts, Fania, don't be a scab, don't shame yourself, stay out here with us. Fania, heavy and arthritic from sitting for almost 40 years behind a sewing machine, waddles and limps into the building as though she hasn't heard Mary, but before the door closes behind her, she shouts back, so how am I going to pay my rent? With the lousy wages they give you, you can hardly pay your rent anyway, Mary yells hoarsely. She's dizzy with elation when the other picketers cheer and Judith shouts, if we had a dozen like this, Mary Alexander and Schwartz would disappear from the face of the earth. The union gives each of the striking workers a little bit of money every week so that they can stay on the picket line and won't have to go looking for work. She still hasn't told Moisha she's striking because she knows he'll say something like, I guess you guys were better off in the old country making a ruble a week. Ass, she thinks, though it doesn't stop her from loving him, and she can't surrender hope that someday, when things get better, they'll be married. She's been counting how many picketers show up each morning, but now there are so many it's impossible to count them. Two hundred at least, on some days maybe four or five hundred. Workers from Alexander and Schwartz who walked out of the shop when they heard the union will give them a few dollars to live on. ILGWU members who come to help their fellow laborers. Passers-by who are moved to join the strikers by the leaflet that's handed to them or by the litany of abuses they hear from those who worked at the company. But not all passers-by are friendly. Mary holds a leaflet out to a pugnacious blonde fellow who sneers at her, Ah, you're just a bunch of commie Jews. At least read it and don't talk from ignorance, she tells him. He spits on her before he walks away. You bastard, one of Mary's draper friends shouts at his back, but Mary calmly wipes the spittle off her shoulder. Jackasses like that can't dampen her passion. Another day, an old union organizer, Pauline Newman, comes to talk to the picketers. Mary squeezes up front with Judith, whose hair still sticks out like it's been electrified, despite the red bandana meant to contain it. Judith tells her that Miss Newman is a close friend of Eleanor Roosevelt's and even advises FDR because she knows everything about the special problems of women workers. She worked at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in 1901 when she was only 11 years old, and though she left long before the fire, she never forgot the women who were killed there, and she's devoted her whole life to women workers. After Judith's gushing description of Polly Newman, Mary is disappointed when she sees the person who finally mounts the soapbox, her hair cut short and severe like a man's, her tailored tweed jacket like a man's too. She wears ugly wire rim glasses that make her look as plain as a boiled potato. Mary has worn shoes with high heels even to work, ever since Goldie told her that high heels flatter the legs. But she sees that Pauline Newman isn't the kind of woman who cares about such things. She wears lace-up shoes. Mary never could understand women like that who do nothing at all to try to improve their appearance. 
But when Polly Newman starts to speak, the hundreds of strikers who are gathered up and down the sidewalks of 38th Street and even spill over into the street are as spellbound as if Greta Garbo were standing on the soapbox. And Mary is as spellbound as any of them. Polly Newman has a Yiddish accent, but her voice is rich and musical. She talks about this, a strike she led in 1909 when she was only 19 years old and how it grew to 20,000 working women and how together they made the garment industry safe for organized labor, which got rid of the sweatshops. For good, they hoped and dreamed. But now, dear friends, there are scoundrels like Alexander and Schwartz, Polly Newman's throaty voice becomes tremulous, who try to turn the terrible tragedy of the Depression to their own advantage, who think desperate workers must put up with any abuse, any injustice, starvation wages, unsanitary conditions, corruption of innocence. But dear friends, Polly Newman's voice rises to a shout, and Mary feels herself rising up on her toes, so transported is she. We're telling Mr. Alexander and Mr. Schwartz that if they think we're going to let them drag us back to the dark ages, they have another think coming. A roar goes up from the crowd. Union, union, union. My mother's throat grows raw with shouting. She tries to hold back tears, but they come spilling out anyway, and she wipes them surreptitiously, a little embarrassed by how carried away she feels. She envies Polly Newman, who knows what's really important and has been able to put everything into the fight for it and hasn't wasted her life drifting rudderless and without purpose. Then the stench of manure reaches her, and she looks into the street and sees three mounted horses. Break it up. This is an illegal gathering. You strikers are stopping traffic, the policemen shout. The horses move relentlessly toward the crowd, and people scream and scatter. The approach of the horses seems to Mary like a dream, and she remains as still as a sleeper, but only for a moment. You go to hell, you jackasses, she screams at the uniformed men. One of them pulls the reins, and his horse trots toward her. The horse halts so close that Mary can see the gleaming drops of sweat on its black coat. It snorts, and moisture from its nostrils splatters on her lip. Pardon me? The policeman asked softly. What was that you said? His eyes shine with pleasure. Judith pulls on Mary's sleeve. Let's get out of here, she breathes. But there's no place to move, and Mary won't be deterred anyway. Jackass bastard, she yells again, and the cop's billy club comes crashing down on her forehead. Lights flash under her lids, and she crumples to the ground. You lousy bully, Judith screams, dropping to her knees beside Mary, shaking her fist at the cop who looks on from the Promethean height of the saddle on top the stallion. Fucking kikes, he sneers, and again swings his billy club, glancing it off Judith's shoulder as he turns his horse toward the other strikers who haven't had the good sense to scatter. The whack isn't hard enough to fell Judith. Mary, are you okay, she cries because Mary hasn't moved. Miserable, miserable bastards, Mary whispers, and her eyelids flutter before she sits up. Oh, sweetie, you're bleeding, Judith says weakly. Mary touches her forehead and feels a swell of flesh. Her fingers come away red. She doesn't wipe the blood away, not even on the subway when she sees people looking at her. Mommy, what happened to that lady, a child asks, and the mother says, shh, that's not polite. That's okay, Mary says. She touches her forehead. The swelling is bigger than a tablespoon now, and she can feel the clotted blood. To her, it's a badge of honor. She goes home and cleans herself up because it's Wednesday night and Moshe is coming to take her out to dinner. She feels really good about herself, sure and strong. Don't exaggerate, you're no Polly Newman, she chides herself. But still, she can't remember how long it's been since she felt so good about herself.